Chapter 17 is from gene to protein. So DNA is, has the nucleotide sequence um, that is inherited from or passed on from one organism to another. Um, and the sequence of those nucleotides is going to lead to certain traits based on the proteins that are formed. Proteins link your genotypes and your phenotypes together. And gene expression is the way in which DNA is able to direct protein synthesis via the processes of transcription and translation. So this relationship between genes and proteins was discovered by a physician um, named Archibald Garrod. Um, he was the first scientist to suggest that genes had an influence on phenotypes, um, perhaps through enzymes that were able to catalyze certain metabolic processes um, that would make sense based on inherited disorders. Um, individuals were unable to synthesize particular enzymes. Um, connecting genes to enzymes um, was one of the necessary steps to help us understand more fully metabolic pathways. So Beetle and Tatum um, were able to perform an experiment that collected data um, to support um, Archibald's claim. He, they created um, mold, bread mold that was mutated. Um, they exposed it to x-rays and they learned that these um, mutant mold organisms were unable to live on minimal media, um, but they were able to perform crosses and identify three classes of mold mutants um, that were lacking different enzymes. And when they had those enzymes as a part of their media, they were able to synthesize arginine. Arginine was what they were deficient in. So their hypothesis was that each gene um, was able to produce one specific enzyme. So there's their experiment. Um, you have your three mutants. Again, minimal media is what um, we were trying to grow them on initially. Wild type are the ones that had not been exposed to x-rays. Um, with the class one, um, they were able to grow whether they had ornithine, citrulline, or arginine present. So the enzyme that they were missing um, was gene, uh, the one that was coded for by gene A. Um, as long as they had ornithine or citrulline or arginine, um, they were able to grow. Um, ornithine was able to turn into arginine, same for citrulline. For class two, the gene that was mutant was the one that converted ornithine to citrulline. So ornithine alone was not going to be sufficient for those mutants to grow they needed um, citrulline or arginine to be successful. And then finally with the class three mutants, um, they were unable to grow through arginine, or ornithine or citrulline. They had to have arginine present because the gene that was mutated in that particular species was gene C, the one that converted citrulline into arginine. So, not every protein is an enzyme, and so that hypothesis was revised slightly um, to represent that one gene codes for one protein. We know now that proteins are not always going to be composed of just a single polypeptide. Um, so with that in mind, um, because you can have a protein made of multiple polypeptides, um, Beetle and Tatum's hypothesis was further restated as a one gene, one in polypeptide hypothesis. Um, and those gene products are referred to as proteins as opposed to polypeptides. So we often call them proteins even though we know that they are not coding for the whole peptide or the whole, the entire protein, especially the ones that are made from multiple polypeptides. The RNA is our bridge between DNA and protein. Transcriptions, when we take our DNA information and convert it into RNA, it's going to result in producing messenger RNA. Translation is when that polypeptide is synthesized off of the mRNA on a ribosome. Prokaryotes are able to do this before um, 
transcription has finished. Eukaryotes um, are not able to because transcription takes place in the nucleus um, and it is separate from translation which takes place on the in ribosomes either free in the cytosol or located um, on the endoplasmic reticulum. Eukaryotic RNA transcripts do require some additional modifications that must take place before they are able to depart the nucleus and be available for translation. Um, the raw transcript is the primary transcript, and so that would be what is initially generated from that transcription process from DNA to RNA. And the central dogma is what connects the three together. The genes are expressed by taking the information from the DNA, transcribing it into RNA, which then can be translated into proteins. So how are we able to determine what amino acids are going to code for which parts of our DNA? Um, there are 20 amino acids, but we only have the four nucleotides present. And so what has been determined is that a three nucleotide sequence known as a triplet code is able to distinguish which amino acids need to join on to form the growing peptide chain. Um, they do this by um, coding for a sequence, a, th a three base sequence that is complementary to what is found on your mRNA. And so it's always going to go from five prime to three prime. So in transcription, we are making a copy of the template strand. And then in translation, we are using those codon sequences that do not overlap on the mRNA identifying which amino acids um, are going to need to be joined together that are going to be carried to that mRNA strand via the tRNA molecules and their respective anticodons, and then they together will make your polypeptide. So specifically with transcription, um, one of your DNA strands is going to help to provide a template um, for the sequence of nucleotides that you need in your RNA transcript. Um, it's always going to be the same strand for a gene, but the other strand that is the non-template strand for that particular gene could be a template strand for another gene. Um, whether it be transcription or translation, the in transcription, the bases are added um, going from five prime to three prime. Um, during translation, that mRNA sequence is read going from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. And then the codons that are found on those triplet bases sequences of the mRNA code for one of your 20 amino acids and determine the order in which those amino acids need to be placed to make the polypeptide chain. Um, there are 64 codons that have been identified that happened by the mid-1960s. Of those 64 codons, all but three code for amino acids. The three that do not are in, uh, signals to indicate that translation should stop. Um, the genetic code is considered to be redundant in that you can have more than one three base pair sequence code for the same amino acid, but that one three base pair sequence can only code for an amino acid, so it's not considered to be ambiguous. Um, it's a, critical that when the codons are being read, that they are being read in the proper reading frame, that you have the correct three bases making up your codon if the correct protein, the correct polypeptide is to be generated. So there is your amino acid chart. There are lots of different amino acid charts, but do notice that there is a green AUG um, sequence for mRNA. Um, and that is going to code for methionine, which is always going to be the first amino acid added on um, to make your polypeptide in translation. And then UAA, UGA, and UAG are going to, when you get to those pieces of codons, or those codons, you know that the sequence is no longer going to be translated, that the polypeptide chain is complete. So this genetic code with the bases and this process of transcription and translation is practically universal. It's shared by um, your simple prokaryotic bacteria all the way to us as humans. 
Um, and so because of that, you can transplant genes that can only be made in technically in one particular species. Here you have a tobacco plant that is um, expressing a firefly gene. So the gene came from fireflies, but that sequence of DNA was embedded in the tobacco plant genome and then it was able to be both transcribed and translated. And we see with the pig that a gene from a jellyfish was added to its genome and it was able to express that as well. So we can have genes from one species be transferred. Um, it takes a fair amount of work. We'll get into that more with biotech. And it can be incorporated into another species genome. So transcription is the first piece of gene expression when we're taking our DNA sequence and using it to make the desired pro protein product. Um, the synthesis of RNA is catalyzed by RNA polymerase, um, specifically RNA polymerase 2. Um, this um, polymerase is able to open up the DNA strands and help to connect the RNA nucleotides to one another to make that single-stranded mRNA sequence. It is complementary to your template strand. The same base pairing rules apply as with DNA, except that adenine now bonds to uracil as opposed to thymine. And so to get this transcription process started, um, RNA polymerase identifies a sequence among the DNA um, that is acting as the promoter. It is located upstream of where the actual transcription process is going to start. Bacteria also have a sequence at the end that indicates that transcription should be completed and it's known as the terminator sequence. The actual stretch of DNA undergoing transcription is known as your transcription unit. So again, you're looking for the promoter area where that RNA polymerase can join on. There's a specific sequence that you're looking for along that um, DNA template strand to know where that RNA polymerase needs to get started. And we're also gonna talk about some other factors that are gonna play a role in helping it get going. Um, it opens up the DNA. Um, again, the RNA is added on going from five prime to three prime. And once that piece of DNA has been transcribed, it gets joined back together. And the transcript continues to be elongated until it has reached um, that termination signal, a little bit different in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and um, the RNA polymerase then um, will separate from your DNA strand. So promoters are gonna signal that start point. Again, they're located just a few base pairs upstream of it. Um, transcription factors, we talked about these a little bit with um, cell communication earlier on. Um, they help to get the RNA polymerase to bind to that DNA and facilitate the initiation of transcription. So transcription factors can play a pretty key role in allowing this process to continue. Um, when the transcription factors in RNA pol 2 are bound to a promoter region, um, we call that complex, that assembly, a transcription initiation complex. The promoter typically contains a ta-ta box, which is just a sequence of thymine and adenine bases, and that is super important in getting this initiation complex um, organized in eukaryotic cells. So there you can kind of see the ta-ta box, part of that promoter region. Um, the transcription factors bind to it, and the transcription factors, once they bind to it, help to allow RNA polymerase II to get into proper place and start to open up that DNA sequence and facilitate the transcription of your RNA. RNA polymerase is able to um, untwist your double helix around approximately 10 to 20 bases at a shot, and it can add on um, 40 nucleotides per second if you're dealing with eukaryotic cells. You can have lots of RNA polymerases working on a piece of DNA at a given time. And as I said previously, you're always going to add nucleotides going from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So there's your open sequence. Again, you can see that your template strand, the dark blue, 
is um, three prime on the left, five prime on the right, but that's all good and well because the RNA is coming out towards that bottom left-hand corner and the RNA nucleotides are being added on the three prime end of that transcription process. So transcription differs in terms of how it's terminated between the bacteria and eukaryotes. And we talked about how bacteria are going to cease transcription when they reach that terminator area, the terminator signal at the end of the DNA. And then because transcription and translation can occur simultaneously in bacteria, no additional modifications are needed. But with eukaryotes, um, RNA polymerase II is going to identify a polyadenylation sequence, which is just multiple, multiple um adenosine um, nucleotides at the end of that DNA sequence. And once it gets to that point, the RNA transcript will be released um, anywhere from 10 to 35 nucleotides after that point. So with eukaryotic cells, some modifications are needed before transcription or between transcription and translation. Um, the raw transcript of RNA that is generated from transcription um, has to be processed. And so there are enzymes in the nucleus that help to make this possible. Um, they cause some modifications to occur at both ends of your transcript. And then splicing can also be involved to connect different pieces of the transcribed RNA um, together. Um, so the common alterations are at the ends. You can have a five prime cap added on, which consists of a nucleotide guanosine along with phosphates. And then you can have a polyadenylation tail, a poly A tail added on at the end as well. These sequences are, or sorry, the cap and the poly A tail are added on um, in part to help to move that RNA transcript out of the nucleus into the cytosol. Um, it also helps to provide some sort of protection for the RNA um, so that it doesn't get chewed up by um, lysosomes or other enzymes that might be available. And it's um, thought to help the ribosome attach to the mRNA sequence when translation is taking place. But there are areas within our DNA transcript um, that once it has been transcribed and that raw mRNA transcript has been made, that contain um, nucleotides that aren't going to code for anything. And so these are known as introns. Um, the regions that actually do get expressed are known as exons. They're the ones that can get converted into amino acids that have complementary um, anticodons that will pair up with those codons. And so RNA splicing will occur where introns get removed and the exons get joined together so that the sequence that actually needs to be translated is continuous and all of those non-coding segments have been removed. Some ways that this occurs is through spliceosomes. Um, spliceosomes are going to consist of proteins as well as small nuclear ribonucleoproteins. We'll talk about why that ribonucleo part is important. Um, but they are able to recognize where the introns need to be cut out and where the exons are in that raw RNA transcript. And we call those small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, SNRMPs. So you see the protein and you see your small nuclear ribosomal um, nucleic acid or ribonucleic acid. Um, so it looks a lot like a tRNA. Um, and those work together along with other proteins um, they are able to bond to that single-stranded RNA and it, um, at the sequences that connect or that point where the exons are going to be separate from the introns. And as they connect there, they can basically break that connection and join the red exons together, um, cutting out your intron altogether. So the spliceosome works, all the different pieces of it work in concert together to cut out the intron sequence, those non-coding intervening sequences, and to connect the coding sequences, the exons, to one another. 
Um, ribozymes can also work to splice RNA. They are catalytic RNA molecules. They work like enzymes. And because they exist, we know now that all catalysts are not necessarily proteins, at least not all biological catalysts are proteins, that RNAs can also act in this manner. Um, why it's able to do it, um, you can kind of see in that previous picture, because we talked about how the SNRNPs consisted of ribonucleotides. Um, they can form three-dimensional structures that are able to base pair. They, can, can, they contain some functional groups that are able to participate in catalytic activities, and they can hydrogen bond to form those temporary attachments um, that can help to um, weaken connections and help to break bonds between those intron and exon nucleotides. Why do we have these introns? Um, some of the introns are able to have an influence on how genes are expressed, when we need to stop expressing them, when we need to continue to express them, or when we need to turn on the expression of those genes. Um, they also exist in part because we can have an individual gene code for multiple polypeptides. Um, it would depend on how those exons are coming together. So you can have more than one RNA transcript from the same sequence of DNA. It reminds me of those choose your own adventure books that I would read when I was younger. You can read it one way and you can read it another way and you get different versions of the same story. So the number of proteins an organism is able to make is much greater than the number of genes that are present on its DNA due to this RNA splicing that can occur. Um, proteins often um, are going to have an architecture with different regions known as domains, and these different exons that are within a um, specific sequence of DNA can code for these different domains. And there's also thought that if these exons within that DNA sequence that has been transcribed are shuffled after that DNA has been transcribed into mRNA, new proteins may evolve um, that may result in helping that population be more successful um, at survival in its environment. So there's just showing you how those different exons can be combined together. Um, to make different forms of that polypeptide or different domains of it. Um, translation is after we have successfully modified our mRNA and we are ready to use it to connect amino acids together to form our polypeptide. So tRNAs are critical. Um, to in, in this translation process because tRNAs are able to um, transfer amino acids to that polypeptide chain via a ribosome. So each tRNA molecule is not identical. It has a specific anticodon sequence and it carries a specific amino acid as a result. Um, those anticodons are able to base pair with their complementary codon on the mRNA. Um, so that they can make sure to correctly match up which amino acids need to be a part of that polypeptide chain. tRNAs are just a single RNA strand that basically, um, if it was flattened, would look like a clover leaf, but 80 nucleotides in three dimensions is actually more of an L shape. But you can kind of see on the opposite end of the anticodon is where the amino acid is able to bind. So the amino acid um, binds at the three prime end of your TNA structure, and then hydrogen bonds are able to hold the tRNA in its shape. Um, and then your anticodon is um, red. If, if you look at your anticodon, it is coding from three prime to five prime, but it's matching up on the mRNA from five prime to three prime. So translation is going to require that each tRNA gets the correct amino acid joined to it, which occurs using amino acid tRNA synthetase, and that that tRNA anticodon 
is matched correctly with an mRNA codon. There is some pairing um, that's a little more flexible with that third base of the codon. It's known as wobble, and that will allow tRNAs to have the ability to join on to multiple codons. So here you have your enzyme that's going to connect your amino acid to your tRNA. The amino acid is going to fit in place with the addition of ATP. Um, it's that amino acid is going to be joined to an AMP molecule. Um, the uncharged tRNA is also able to fit in the active site of this enzyme. It displaces the AMP and binds to that amino acid. And once it has bound, it is able to be released from your enzyme. And now you have the charged tRNA molecule, amino acid tRNA. Your tRNA has an amino acid attached to it. Ribosomes are able um, to facilitate the coupling of the anticodons that are found on your tRNA molecules with the codons that are present on your mRNA. Um, there are two ribosomal subunits that make up your ribosomes, a large and a small one. They are made of both proteins and another form of RNA, ribosomal RNA. Um, the bacteria and eukaryotic ribosomes are similar, but they do have some differences, and because that would mean that bacteria are going to make proteins a little bit differently than eukaryotic cells are. Um, it's a good target for um, antibiotics um, so that you can stop bacteria from producing proteins to allow them to grow um, and allow the eukaryotic ribosomes to continue to do their job. Each ribosome contains three binding sites for these tRNA molecules, a P site, an A site, and an E site. Um, the P site is going to hold the tRNA that is going to have the amino acid next added to the polypeptide chain. The A site actually holds the tRNA that, or sorry, the P site holds the tRNA that has the amino acid chain attached to it. So all the amino acids that have formed peptide bonds and been connected together are at that point, the tRNA that is at the P site are connected to that one. The A site contains the tRNA that has the next amino acid to be joined on. And then the E site is where the tRNA that has transferred the polypeptide chain to the amino acid in the P site um, is no, that amino acid, sorry, that tRNA no longer has an amino acid attached to it. It is a discharged tRNA. It leaves and then can have another amino acid added onto it using that um, enzyme we previously discussed, amino acid tRNA synthetase. So P site is where your peptide chain grows. A site is preparing to add on to your polypeptide. E site is where the empty tRNA mol, um, units are going to um, be found prior to leaving the ribosome. So the P site is what's that tRNA is what's holding on to your polypeptide chain. And then the, when the peptide bond forms between the P and the A, T, um, the polypeptide chain and the amino acid that's present on the A, um, there will be a translocation process where the tRNA that was in the A site moves to the P site, the one that was in the P site moves to the E site, the one that was in the E site exits, and a new tRNA gets placed into the A site um, to be ready to add on to the growing polypeptide. So just like with transcription, there are three stages to translation, initiation, elongation, and termination. All these are going to require some proteins to help to facilitate this process. Um, with the initiation stage of translation, you have your mRNA sequence, you have your tRNA that has the initial first amino acid, and your small and your large ribosomal subunits. Initially, that small ribosomal subunit is going to bind to your mRNA and that specific initiator tRNA that contains the methionine amino acid. The small subunit moves along that mRNA until it reaches the three codons, or sorry, the three bases um, that code for the codon that will get things started, AUG. Um, 
Proteins known as initiation factors help to bring that large subunit into play. And when that occurs, you now have your translation initiation complex ready to go. So you can have an mRNA sequence being translated at multiple spots. So you can have a polyribosome, you can have multiple ribosomes um, growing, um, making polypeptides um, at different pieces of that mRNA. So you do not just have to have the mRNA sequence code for a single polypeptide, it can code for multiple. So there's your initiator tRNA with its anticodon that's going to bind to the codon sequence on your mRNA containing methionine. Once that has bound, GTP along with other proteins is going to bring in that large ribosomal subunit such that, that the methionine initiator tRNA is located in the P site. And at that point, you have your translation initiation complex. As elongation takes place, the amino acids get added on um, to the preceding amino acid via peptide bonds at the C terminus. Remember, your amino acids have an amino group as, as well as a carboxyl group making up their amino acids. So the C terminus, we're talking about the N portion, the amino portion of that amino acid forming a peptide bond with the carboxyl section of the prior amino acid. Um, so, for the elongation process to occur, um, elongation factors are needed. These are proteins, and you need three things to take place. You need to identify which codon is next up, you, a peptide bond needs to form, and then the tRNA that is no longer holding on to an amino acid needs to translocate, and the tRNA that now has the peptide chain needs to move to that P site. Um, so translation moves from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So again, once you have your initial tRNA in place and you continue to allow that polypeptide chain to grow, the tRNA holding the polypeptide chain is in the P site. The A site brings the next amino acid to be joined on. GTP is going to help to form that peptide bond between the amino acid that is in the A spot and the polypeptide chain that's part of the P site. Once that has occurred, once we have matched up our codons with our anticodons, um, we now will have the peptide chain be connected to the tRNA that's in the A site. Um, the P site, um, or sorry, translocation will occur via GTP that will move the uncharged um, tRNA molecule to the E site and allow it to exit and to translocate the tRNA holding the polypeptide chain to the P site. And then that can continue to go on until the end of translation. Um, that part, termination, will occur when you reach one of the three sets of bases that codes for a stop codon. At that point, a protein will join on, known as a release factor, in the A site. And rather than joining another amino acid and forming a peptide bond, a water molecule will get added to that amino acid. And when the water molecule gets added, it causes that polypeptide to be released. And your whole translation uh, assembly, the two subunits of your ribosome, the mRNA and that release factor, are all um, able to separate from one another. So as I said, I talked to you about polyribosomes. You can have um, multiple ribosomes translating an mRNA transcript simultaneously. Um, so this is going to be helpful. Um, so you could have it be making multiple copies of the same protein, especially if you need a lot of a certain polypeptide at um, fairly quickly within your cells. Um, translation does not always finish everything off. Um, sometimes there need to be modifications made um, to those polypeptide chains or there needs to be directions given as to where they need to move to in the cell. Um, remember we talked about how proteins have um, their different structures, the primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, way back at the beginning of the year. 
Um, so we do have to have some coiling occur to get it into its proper shape. This can take place while it's being synthesized as well as afterwards. Um, and then sometimes there are modifications that have to be made. Um, some polypeptides are inactive initially. They have to be cleaved by enzymes to activate them so they can do their jobs. And again, as we've talked about, you can have multiple polypeptide chains come together to form a functional protein. Um, polypeptides um, typically are going to be um, made on ribosomes that are in the cytosol that are free, as well as those that are bound, those that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. The ones that are free in the cytosol typically are going to make proteins that are needed there. Um, the ones that are making proteins um, that are a part that are on the bound ribosomes that are attached to the ER typically are making those that need to go into that particular system as well as those that are leaving the cell. And ribosomes can move back and forth between being free ribosomes or being bound ribosomes. So the synthesis of polypeptides will always start in the cytosol and it ends in the cytosol so that those proteins are going to stay there unless there is some signal sent to the ribosome by the polypeptide that it needs to attach to the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, those that need to, the polypeptides that need to end up in the endoplasmic reticulum or need to be secreted have a signal peptide added on and a signal recognition particle, an SRP, binds to it and directs where it needs to go. Um, so it kind of connects it and ends it to its final destination. So it'd be like the, um, the postal carrier delivering mail to your house. Your address directs it where it needs to go. So there's your ribosome. In this particular case, the peptide that has been formed does have a signal peptide attached to it. SRP joins to that and allows it to join to a receptor on that endoplasmic reticulum. Um, once it has joined, the signal peptide can be removed. That peptide can either enter the ER or then is able to be directed to leave the cell. So this section here is probably going to cover a fair amount that you saw in your first bio class. Um, how nucleotide mutations can affect your protein structure. We talked about chromosomal mutations earlier, but these are mutations occurring in your genetic material. Um, they could be single base pair mutations, point mutations, that could cause um, an abnormal protein to be generated. So we see that with sickle cell where you have a specific amino acid change due to that one base, and it's at um, a very critical spot in that particular um, polypeptide chain. And you can have multiple um, nucleotide pair changes that involve insertions or deletions um, that are classified as point mutations along with just substitutions. So, if you have a substitution and it does not change the amino acid that would be joined on, um, that is called a silent mutation. And that is due to the fact that there are several codon sequences that are very similar that code for the same amino acid. Um, you can also have a missense mutation where you still have an amino acid coded for, but it's not the amino acid that you need to, you were supposed to have as a part of that protein. Nonsense mutations are going to cause a preliminary or premature translation um, to or premature termination to translation. I'll get it out. I'm so sorry. Um, and that typically leads to a protein that no longer is able to function properly. Insertions and deletions are a much bigger issue. Um, because they're going to change your reading frame. They're going to change your three base pair sequence making up your codons. And if that happens and you have a frame shift mutation, there's a lot more um, at play that can cause issues with the polypeptides that are being formed. So your nuclear pair substitution may or may not have any impact on your amino acid sequence. A missense mutation 
will change which amino acid gets put into play. A nonsense mutation will cause your protein to be um, terminated before it was intended to. Insertions or deletions can cause, depending on how much, I mean, if it's only a three, if it's a three in base pair insertion or three base pair deletion, yes, you're going to have a change in your amino acids, but you are not going to have um, a total shift with your frame. Um, however, if you had a single base pair or two base pairs, either inserting or deleting, that can have much greater consequences um, due to that frame shift change. Um, mutagens are one source of how these mutations can occur. Um, they can take place with replication. They can also occur during recombination or sometimes as a result of repairing previous um, errors in DNA processes. Um, these are both physical and chemical agents. So gene expression will differ among all of the domains of life, eukarya, archaea, and, and bacteria. Um, but the idea of a gene is not going to change. So although archaea are prokaryotes, the way that they are able to express their genes is similar to that of eukaryotes. Um, so if we compare these three domains, bacteria and eukarya have different RNA polymerases because they have a different transcription termination. Again, eukarya have transcription occur in um, membrane-bound organelles. Bacteria do not have those other than your ribosomes. And the ribosomes themselves are not membrane-bound. And then you have um, different characteristics or different proteins being used to make those ribosomes. Archaea are more similar to eukarya in terms of these different aspects we just talked about. We talked about how bacteria can both transcribe and translate at the same time. Eukarya is separate. Archaea is most likely going to be done in concert with one another. So in, that, in this particular aspect, archaea are more like bacteria. So throughout time, um, throughout our study of genetics and now looking at DNA and the processes involved in replication and transcription and translation, um, initially genes were thought of as specific discrete units of inheritance, a section of nucleotides making up your DNA on your chromosome, um, and that they are DNA sequences um, that code for specific polypeptides. Well, we know now that these DNA sequences don't just necessarily code for polypeptides. They basically are able to be expressed to produce a product that then can be functional. That product could be a polypeptide, but as we've seen with the snRNAs and the rRNAs and our tRNAs, they can also be RNA molecules. So there is kind of an overview of everything we've talked about.